Uh, just a few words about our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Alice the Driver. Um, uh, so very well known in conservation and catchment management circles, um, uh, appointed as the first ever conservation officer for the Thames catchment in 1984, uh, head of conservation for the Environment Agency, uh, 2002-2016. Uh, a Fellow of the Institute of Ecology and Environment Management, Honorary Professor in Applied Environmental Management at the University of Exeter, but as well as all that, a former first-class rugby player uh, for London Irish, would you believe, uh, and, but now a fanatical all-round naturalist, self-confessed moth botherer, uh, man of my own heart, I bother those moths quite frequently myself, uh, trapping and recording for 50 years. Not the name of 50 years though, but, uh, I'm, but I do it quite frequently at the moment. Uh, um, and even as a pond named after him, would you believe? Um, in, his, in, his, 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 in his home village of Sonning in Berkshire uh, and his local nature reserve. Uh, and but for COVID, I guess, um, as the director of Rewild in Britain, he'd be, um, he'd be out and about around England and Wales, um, speaking with people uh, and groups raising the awareness and the profile of rewilding Britain. Uh, and, and maybe it's gonna be starting doing a bit of that fairly soon. Uh, but we're so pleased and so thankful and be very grateful for him to be, so I've agreed to speak with us tonight um, virtually. So without further ado, over to you, Alistair. Thank you, Mark. I uh, really appreciate that welcome. Uh, it's such a pity that I can't be there with you. Um, I'd love an excuse to get back to uh, to North Wales, but um, hopefully it won't be long. But um, yeah, um, really looking forward to this myself. I'm planning to talk for 40 or 45 minutes, probably about rewilding. I'll be talking about uh, principles, definition, making sure we're on on the same page, uh, which is very important as part of any talk I give, I think, to, to get these these key messages out there, um, but also to look at, particularly look at policy opportunities and specific issues. Um, you see in the title of the talk, Busting the Myths and Making it, make it Happen. There is quite a lot of mythology around rewilding. There are many different opinions as well, and uh, rewilding Britain doesn't, doesn't own the right to a particular opinion, but it's obviously important that we've got a, a, a clear definition and a clear set of principles that support the work we do. So I'm going to run through all of those and then I, you know, welcome as many questions as, as, as we've got time for really when it comes to the end, because that's always, for me, that's always the best bit is, is hearing questions and, and, and fielding concerns, etc. Um, first of all, just to say a little bit about Rewilding Britain. We're a tiny organisation, um, a very small charity. Uh, we've actually grown to 12 uh, people now, who all of whom are part time. So we've got the equivalent of seven full time people now. We cover England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, there are two of us that uh, tend to be, I suppose, the ones at the front line, and that's Rebecca Wrigley, who's our chief executive, who is George Monbiot's partner. But I hasten to add, George has no no um, involvement in the organization. I, I haven't even met George yet. Um, and I think I've had one uh, Zoom call with him about three years ago. Um, so um, so he does, although, he, although he was a founder with Rebecca, um, he's, he's not actually involved in, in the organization at all. Um, and then there's myself and um, my role is twofold really. First of all, it's going out there and uh, helping landowners, advising farmers and landowners around the country and, and other organisations like the Wildlife Trust, um, uh, a National Trust, RSPB, etc., uh, to move up the rewilding spectrum where they want to do so. And I'll talk about that spectrum later. Um, so I, on the one hand, I'm out on site a lot and I am back in action now. I was down in Kent last week, Hampshire the week before, and I've got um, uh, a lot of trips now booked up through May and June. Um, so that's part, a key part of my role, but the other key part is to influence policy at the highest level that I can. Um, so, uh, for example, I responded on behalf of the organisation to the Agricultural Agriculture Wales Bill, 
which again I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later because um, there are great opportunities around that. Um, so, so that's that's the gist of it. Then we have a few we have a fundraising person, a few communications people behind the scene, etc. Um, but yes, very tiny. We went into act as a catalyst. Um, we don't intend to be a big organization. We don't own land. We don't intend to own land. Just trying to help make it happen. And it, and I always say, if we're really successful, uh, you know, you won't need us in 20, 30 years time. Um, that probably won't happen. We probably will still be here. But, uh, but you know, a, a measure of success would be if all organizations are adopting rewilding where appropriate. It's just an option in the toolbox of measures to help restore biodiversity and help mitigate climate change. And if all, all organizations, including governments, are doing that, then you know that's a massive that's a massive step forward. But we've got a long way to go before we get to that point, uh, as we will explore today. So I just wanted to first of all give you a little bit of my background, my personal background. So uh, home for me was uh, a, a 500 year old cottage in the Cotswolds under the Beechwoods. My dad was a country naturalist. And so he taught me all those things that you're not really supposed to do anymore, quite rightly, like collecting birds, eggs and pinning insects, um, etc. Uh, but that's how I learned my natural history um, and uh, became uh, enthusiastic about wildlife. And he used to run bird watching trips uh, to Bardsey Island in the 50s. And in the 60s and early 70s, we owned a house there, Carrigvale. Um, our, uh, sorry, we rented a house there from Lord Newborough uh, on the island for many years. And that was where I spent every holiday of every year of my youth, from literally a babe in arms to when I went to university. And I've subsequently been back several times. My children have been back there uh, as teenagers, and now they want to take their children there. Problem is they live in America now. But, uh, but uh, anyway, um, it is a place that I'm desperate to get back to. I'm, I'm seriously hoping I might get back there this year. I haven't been for about 10 years now, but um, uh, a place dear to my heart. And if you see that image, that was a sketch done by a chap called David Bygott um, of our living room back in 1970s, early 70s. And you can see it's uh, littered with various natural history artifacts, um, like including a Manx water stuffed Manx water hanging from the ceiling. So that, that was my upbringing. I describe it as feral. You know, I spent all my time pretty much outdoors, studying nature, exploring the countryside um, and, and roaming wild and free. I was lucky enough to get a, a degree in ecology and, and then very lucky to become the first conservationist, the first full-time conservationist in this country working on rivers. Uh, as a full-time job. I was the conservation officer for the Thames Water Authority. And um, when I started back in the early 80s, um, I, I was dealing with these kinds of schemes, concreting, concreting of rivers um, and um, dredging of rivers in rural areas um, to drain floodplains for growing uh, crops in, in largely inappro inappropriate soils. Um, and so um, that job was cre was created basically because water authorities had a duty to further conservation when carrying out their functions. And in the early years for me, that wasn't just about crouching in reed beds. That was also about trying to trying to encourage these schemes and, and projects to be done in a more sensitive way. As time passed, I gradually was able to develop that into uh, proactive river and wetland uh, restoration schemes. And so these are examples of the sorts of things I was doing, whether it be uh, sensitive bank protection using uh, coir fiber rolls planted with vegetation rather than using uh, concrete and steel, um, or a flood scheme like the Jubilee River, where instead of just creating a flood, straight flood channel, we created extensive wetlands on an eight mile long river the size of the Thames, new flood flood river, flood bypass river, the size of the Thames, or restoring meanders in the in rivers as we did 
uh, in uh, in uh, actually that's an incorrect <laughs> incorrect title. That should be the River Cole at Swindon, uh, where we put the bends back on a national trust site, and or, or, or creating large wetlands like the London Wetlands Centre, which I was um, very privileged to be involved in helping with. So so moved from preventing bad things, just preventing bad things from happening, to trying to help good things to happen. The reason, part of the reason I've given you this background, apart from to show you I'm, I'm a, a naturalist and an ecologist by training, um, part of the reason is that uh, when I uh, joined, uh, when I left the Environment Agency after 34 years in this public service, um, uh, I was fully aware of this premise, that all that stuff that I had had the great privilege to be involved in with thousands of people from hundreds of organisations over those 34 years, um, all that stuff is not enough. We are still going backwards on biodiversity. We're still losing the battle with climate change mitigation. And so I'm absolutely certain and have been for some time that we need something else besides. And uh, we mustn't give up on all of this, uh, what I call traditional nature, nature conservation, uh, which is nature reserves, protected sites, good planning policies, agri-environment schemes, uh, and practices of, of the Environment Agency, NRW, etc., uh, in terms of conservation projects on the back of flood defence, etc., uh, you know, we shouldn't give up on those. We desperately need those. And goodness knows where we'd be if we hadn't initiated all this kind of activity. But it's not enough. We need something else besides. And my firm belief is that uh, a, a key missing link, if you like, is rewilding. Now, this is the uh, definition of rewilding, or summary definition of rewilding that Rewilding Britain use. Um, and I'll just quickly flag a couple of things here. So large scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature is allowed to take care of itself. First thing to say is that large scale, what do we mean by large scale? And probably in England and Wales, we don't mean very large at all, not in global terms. Um, uh, so probably ideally, you know, five, uh, uh, 100, 500 or 1000 acres would be fantastic. But actually, even at 250 acres plus, you can move on to that rewilding spectrum and start to restore natural processes um, uh, at a, to a reasonable extent. We'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, but so, so scale wise, relatively small in global terms. Um, and then there's this the business about to the point where nature is allowed to take care of itself. And that, that is a very long journey to get to that point. If you are allowing that at a large scale of say a thousand acres, then it could take a very long time to get to that point. Um, and so, and we shouldn't be too preoccupied about, you know, whether we actually finally reach that destination. And I would say when you've got there, you've effectively you've rewilded, you're not rewilding, you rewilded. Rewilding is a present participle, and it and, you know, and it it means an ongoing uh, activity for quite a long time. I describe often describe it as a a marathon with a sprint start, and that sprint start is is all about early intervention to kickstart these recovery the, this recovery of natural processes. So it is very much about reinstating natural processes. And one can do this in a, in a multitude of ways. It might be um, restoring peat bogs. It'll always mean allowing natural regeneration. If you're not allowing natural regeneration, then you're not rewilding. Um, but it could be restoring peat bogs. It could be, it, it could involve tree planting in certain circumstances, restoring rivers and wetlands, uh, modifying grazing regimes, of course, um, allowing animals to roam over a much wider landscape um, and where appropriate reintroducing key missing species uh, which which help um, themselves uh, to reinstate natural processes um, and I'll talk at the end uh, about a few species um, later on. 
So the thing to remember is that it does represent a spectrum of activity. And this graph, which I plagiarized from John Lawton's work, um, shows you management intensity from low to high in the vertical axis and project size uh, along the horizontal axis. And most of our nature reserves are up in the top left hand corner. They're relatively small and they are intense, relatively intensively managed. Most of the rewilding sites are down in the bottom left hand corner, less managed, but still quite small. What we what we should aim to be doing is moving towards the center of that graph, increasing the project size whilst um, reducing management. So that's the direction of travel for rewilding. And as I say, if you got to the bottom right hand corner, you've probably rewilded. But we should focus on the journey. Just getting to the middle of that graph is a very significant step forward for, for us here in certainly in England and Wales. Um, and so, so that's, that's, um, the, that's the magnitude of uh, the issue. That's the direction of travel. And these are our key principles. And I'll just quickly run through these. I hope you know, they're well understood now. We have to do this in harmony with people. We have to, we do this in, in collaboration with local communities. Uh, it cannot work without, without people uh, in the countryside, in, su in such a densely populated country, Homo sapiens obviously belongs here just as much as any other species. So in such a densely populated country, we need, you know, this needs to be developed uh, with, with people as a fundamental core of it. And this is not just gratuitous words. This is absolutely how it has to be. And all of the rewilding projects I'm dealing with obviously uh, uh, have developed in, in that way. Now, the extent to which they engage with other stakeholders varies from site to site and from location to location, but there has to be some form of community engagement for it to be working at scale, because you're, you're bound to be dealing with more than one landowner if you're going to be working at the kind of scale that we're talking about. So working at nature scale is important, and what we mean by that really is, is, is making sure that we're operating at such a scale the way you can expect biodiversity to recover significantly and you can expect to be able to measure the, the ecosystem services that may be generated from this large-scale restoration. Uh, you should, you know, it should be at such a scale that you can measure the benefits to flood risk, reduce flood risk or improve water quality or improve carbon sequestration etc. Uh, we need to be allowing nature to lead as I've, I've already mentioned, moving towards that point where nature is determining what happens where. And in doing all of this, we, we need to be ensuring that we create resilience in local economies. You, you, it won't be sustainable unless it is economically viable to be operating in this way. And of course, it has to be for the long term, not least because it takes a long time for quite a few of these benefits to be realized. And it will take quite a long time for that economic resilience to be properly established. So this it has to require long term, long term commitments, uh, and we, we'll come back to that maybe when we talk about policy. So these are the, these are rewilding Britain's key principles, um, and we have an ambition for at least five percent of Britain, England, that's England, Scotland, and Wales, to be rewilding, uh, but connected with and buffered by another 25% of nature friendly farming and forestry etc. So you will often hear about this 30 by 30 uh, a target that government site and wildlife trust etc site that's that's how we see the 30% uh, being being split between what we call core rewilding and nature friendly farming nature friendly land use that's 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 an ambition that we want to try and catalyze but it it does you know put it into perspective we're not we're not talking about rewilding every everywhere by by any means and i've done some analysis of 23 sites uh, which i've uh, visited all of which i've been involved with they were either re sites that were rewilding. In it. These are English sites. And by the way, all of this talk 
uh, any examples I give in this talk are from England because that's what I've been covering intensively for the last three years. I've been with Rewilding Britain for four years now and I've been focusing particularly on England in the last three years, uh, partly because there's been a growing level of interest. So more and more landowners are coming to me to, to Rewilding Britain for advice. So I've done analysis of these sites. They're a mix of private sites and NGO managed sites. And interestingly, over 50%, there's over 50% of the livestock units still on those sites after they started rewilding. And that's because we don't have the native herbivores that we should have like bison and elk and boar and beaver. And you need herbivores in this landscape, messing things up, uh, helping uh, uh, helping to, to create this heterogeneity in vegetation and in, in soil condition and et cetera, et cetera. So small numbers of free roaming uh, proxy herbivores is the norm for these rewilding sites. It's not pure rewilding. Like I say, we don't have those formerly native herbivores and we certainly don't have the top end carnivores like lynx and wolf and bear. And so we, we have these herbivores. And if you've got these herbivores, then they will be harvested. And so they are still producing food, but approximately 50% of the amount of food they produced beforehand. But interestingly, that entire reduction of 50%, approximately 50% is accounted for by sheep numbers. Actually, the numbers of beef cattle and pigs uh, have gone up slightly overall across the 23 sites. Um, and, sit, and, and so the sheep numbers are, the, uh, are where the change has been. And I've done an extrapolation for this. Uh, and if we delivered 5% rewilding at the same level of, of livestock unit change as these 23 sites so far, then we would see a 3% reduction in sheep numbers nationally. And I was I had a conversation last week, a meeting last week with a head of the National Sheep Association, and uh, Phil Stocker and his chairman. And he said that that, that was nothing. 3% change was, was nothing, not something they would, you know, that, that they would uh, uh, lie awake worrying about because there are so many other impacts on, on sheep, not least uh, market forces, uh, changes post-Brexit, changes in, in meat eating habits, etc. So although people may throw out this, this, this point about, oh, how are we gonna, how are we gonna feed the world if we rewild everywhere? You know, that's not really the issue. We're not, re no one's rewilding everywhere. Uh, we're talking about 5%. 5% has a, a negligible impact um, and these sites still produce food. I would encourage you to look at the Rewilding Britain website if you haven't already. We've, we've that revamped it in uh, about six months ago and and there are now there's now pages about marine rewilding there are pages about making your garden wilder etc uh, please take a look at it rewilding on a small scale there's a section on that as well we want we want everyone to feel that they can contribute towards rewilding at any scale but the bigger the scale you operate at the, the you know the more likely you are, it is that you're going to be on the rewilding spectrum and that you're going to be moving up that spectrum and particularly take uh, you know encourage you to take a look at the rewilding network i'm really delighted with the way this has developed we have a, a great member of the team sarah king who's who's managing this network it was always a dream of mine and rebecca's you know when we started this organization uh, so, sorry when we started working for the organization four years ago that uh that we would have a network which would connect people up, share best practice, share experiences, discussions on, on certain topics, maybe even post lockdown, arranging field visits uh, to flagship sites. Um, and, and that's going really well. We've got nearly 30 case studies on there now, what are called member projects here. And uh, we have local networks developing as well, which is great. The case studies and the network projects are all shown on this map. And this is an example of uh, one of the case studies, RSPB Horsewater. Uh, they're shown in green, uh, green flags on this map. 
you will notice that there is nothing in Wales. And I would love to start to get a few green flags on there from Wales. It's, it's not for the want of trying, but we haven't yet had anyone uh, approach us uh, at this at the scale 250 acres plus who uh, who have, have said you know they'd like to be on here but I'm sure there are projects out there uh, but we have been generally responding uh, reacting if you like to approaches and most of those approaches have come from England and Scotland but I am now starting to follow up on one or two in Wales which is which is great but if you do know of any uh, sites which you would say well these are already rewilding or they're or you know they're planning to rewild at 250 acres plus we'd like we'd love to get them on to this uh to, onto these pages as as case studies and what i would do is i would go and uh, i would have communication with them and if they wanted me to visit i'd go and visit them and then we'd draw up a case study we do have a network uh in wales and we don't have any details for it yet but there is a, a y valley network which are shown in the blue flag here in Wales. Um, but I've used this Yorkshire example um, just, just to show you that uh, there are networks who are up and running and who are starting to bring people together at the county scale. And uh, you know, I'd love to see one for North Wales, for example. Uh, I've already had conversations with a great ladder that uh, Mark and I know called Ben Porter, who I know from Bardsey and um, you know, he, he he is interested in helping to bring people together. So we might have a fledgling network developing there in North Wales. And this network, as I say, this is aiming to share good practice, uh, successes and failures, of course, learning from failures is very important. Uh, developing toolkits and guidance, running webinars on specific subjects, uh, connecting people up uh, and sharing new and better evidence as it emerges. Now, a lot of people will ask, what, well, what does rewilding look like? And actually, one of the best ways of demonstrating this is just to show, is to show generic uh, animation. So I've got uh, a lowland animation here, which I'd like to share with you. And then I'll follow it with an upland one, which we're just, uh, we're just developing at the moment. So this was actually produced by the, by the NEP estate uh, for an example of lowland rewilding uh, in a lowland landscape and both and both of these scenarios are you know relevant to parts different parts of Wales so first of all this landscape as you can see it's got you know quite significant infrastructure in it it's got a clearly a, a straightened river it's got regimental uh, field pastoral landscape uh, fairly intensive grazing and agricultural use. And I will run the animation and you will see this gradual transition through to a much wilder state, but it's not as wild as you, you will see in the upland one that I'm going to show in a minute. But you will see connectivity starting to be encouraged through that landscape, green bridges, etc. Better hedgerows, wider, wider hedge margins, pockets of wild habitat, semi-wild habitat appearing, particularly in the floodplains, um, in the floodplain, wetlands, wetlands, river restoration, etc., and species returning. And that's that's the sort of scene we would expect to see in in lowland Britain, where there is, you know, there is still going to be some uh, agriculture going on, but generally speaking, it's a much wilder, much more natural looking landscape. And, and you can see that that's, you know, that's, there's probably a blurred edge there between nature friendly farming and rewilding. Some parts of this landscape are definitely rewilding. Others are nature friendly farming. Uh, it, is a blur, it is a blurred boundary, but much more of this kind of large scale rewilding, particularly in river corridors is the sort of thing that we should aspire to. And then I just need to see if I can move on to, to the upland situation. So here, this is a, a more of a classic English upland situation, but you will see elements of this in, in Welsh uplands. So you have 
uh, again, you know, quite an intensively managed landscape, obviously in this case, intensively sheep grazed, uh, eroding peat hags, regimented blocks of conifer forestry and more burning going on, straightened river channels, probably embanked in places as well, uh, and, and uh, a limited amount of wildlife, the sorts of things, generalist, generalist species that you would expect like foxes and corvids, etc., uh, and obviously red grouse if you're up on the moors. So this is, this is the starting point, and there are lots of landscapes in Northern England that look like this. I've got lots of photos that look very similar. In fact, I gave photos to the animator for, in order for him to, uh, to create this kind of view. And I will run the, 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 uh, the animation. It's only three images actually, but it shows this transition through to a much wilder situation. If I just pause it here in the middle picture, you will see natural regeneration being allowed in place of the conifer plantations which have been removed. River has restored back to its uh, original sinuous channel. Uh, road moved away from the river to the edge of the floodplain. Uh, natural regen starting to uh, attract more wildlife back. And running it on into a much an even wilder situation where we've uh, taken uh, taking the opportunity to reintroduce one or two species. So uh, you can see a lynx in the, in the tree there and uh, a wildcat. Uh, I'll talk about I'll talk about reintroductions later, so uh, I, won't, I won't dwell on that now, but I'll come back to those later. And if there are any species I don't talk about that you want to you want to discuss, then don't hesitate to ask. But this is the kind of scene that we would like to see at scale in some of our uplands. And, and we believe, well, so I know because I've seen them. Pocket, I've seen pockets of this, not necessarily with, with lynx and wildcat in, but you know, I've seen pockets of this regeneration and restored rivers and they look fantastic it's in eminently doable and the important thing to note is there are still people in this landscape uh, there are still crops or being produced for example in polytunnels in the bottom of the valley in the homestead there and there are still products coming from this land there are still grazing animals in this landscape So I just want to move on now to some of the key benefits of rewilding. I've got a whole lecture on 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 this, which I could give separately, but just just quickly to give you some examples here. Um, we know because there's an increasing amount of monitoring of upland and lowland restoration projects, but particularly uplands, that restoring peat bogs, restoring woodlands and trees to upland landscapes uh, has a significant benefit for water quality, for flood risk, uh, for carbon sequestration, etc. We know this and actually when I was in the Environment Agency I helped to drive through the natural flood management policy for the agency in, in the last couple of years of my time there and, and as part of that, uh, part of the justification for that, I pulled together a lot of data and information from measured benefits of projects on the ground. It's so much more convincing and compelling to be able to demonstrate changes on the ground rather than model, modeled or predicted. And so I concentrated on bringing together what I call these killer facts, uh, which, which helped, helped to convince the powers that be that yes, there was enough evidence out there that natural flood management worked and, and we should make more of it. And so, you know, consistently doing these, implementing these kind of interventions in upland landscapes reduces peak flows by consistently 20 to 30 percent. That regular, you know, irrespective of the type of intervention, that, that, that those kind of figures regularly emerge if it's done consistently at scale uh, across uh, an upper catchment area. That's very significant in terms of the, the reduced risk to communities downstream. And I'm pleased to say that, you know, there is some form of monitoring taking place on all 23 of the sites that I've assessed just recently in England, which is great because this is going to build a, a greater body of evidence to help convince policymakers that, you know, there should be more investment in this, in this option for the countryside. 
And there is also a, a, a great range of economic opportunities available to, to landowners who, who want to move up the rewilding spectrum. This is just these are examples from around the country, and I've deliberately chosen a range of examples. So education and events, uh, nature-based tourism, forest lodges, health and well-being, uh, fantastic gin being produced from the Heppel estate in Northumberland. Um, and, and very importantly, for this 22 sites for which I had data, a 47% increase in the number of jobs on these rewilding sites compared with uh, prior compared with when they were farmed prior to rewilding. Re and this, this is very significant and obviously uh, attracted quite a bit of attention for um, uh, when I sent this to government, government uh, ministers. Also, very importantly, numbers of volunteers have gone up ninefold. Again, incredibly significant um, because there are tremendous health and wellbeing benefits associated with volunteering, as you, as you folks will know, uh, as associated with volunteering in a in a in a, a nature rich environment, working on things that uh, have a feel good factor to them. So so again, knock on benefits for health and well being through that kind of activity. Now moving on to policy, you, you in Wales you've got some fantastic uh, policies. They are world-class in terms of their aspiration and they contain a lot of the kind of uh, wording that you would you know that you would expect to see that would help to deliver uh, uh, nature-based solutions and would help to deliver natural processes at scale it's um it's wonderful to see this but having policies is one thing uh, having changes in practice is another so we now have this golden opportunity through the sustainable land management proposals which are, uh, have emerged in this consultation document for Wales. Now I've been involved in the, uh, the environmental land management scheme consultation in England uh, and we, we were successful in getting rewilding included in the top tier of, a future, of future proposals for environmental land management in England as an option, just an option, but it's there. It's now being mentioned in guidance for farmers that if they want to go down that route, then that option is available to them. Uh, so I responded on behalf of Rewilding Britain to this Wales white paper after consulting various colleagues in Wales from other organizations. And although I understand that we can't necessarily call it rewilding because there, you know, there are, there are greater sensitivities around it. Um, nevertheless, we promoted the same principles, this, this large scale uh, promotion of natural process recovery. And we've also uh, strongly encouraged a network of, of advisors to be established. I'd, you know, it'll, it'll be very difficult to roll out such ambitious, ambitious public money for public good schemes, unless there's a network of good advisors available to farmers and landowners. And now in England, there are these uh, three options for, for the uh, farming community under this future environmental land management scheme. Now, there's no suggestion in the consultation document for Wales that they're going to go down this route of tiers, if you like, three tiers or components. But I'd like to think that there will be the, the range of these kind of incentives. So an incentive for uh, sustainable farming, basically, which would be the sort of bottom tier, if you like, and a middle tier that would incentivize nature friendly farming, lo local nature recovery, as it's called here in the ELM scheme. And then at the top end, landscape recovery. Uh, and, and the scale they're talking about here in England is quite significant. It will, it will necessitate landowners joining up with each other because they, they are aspiring to 2000 hectare plus project sites. That's big, that's very significant. So, so yeah, um, whether, that, whether that will happen, I'm not sure, but that will require a sort of farm cluster approach being adopted on a grand, grand scale. But these are the sort of levels of uh, incentive and types of incentive that 
it would be good to see in in the future Wales scheme. Uh, like I say, it'll probably just be one scheme by the sounds of it. But if if these different things can be incentivized, then that's a massive step forward. And this is how the Elm example might work. Um, and, and so, you know, it's a generic example, a schematic that I did specifically for the Elm scheme, but the same could apply in Wales. You'd have core rewilding areas buffered by nature friendly farming areas connected to each other by these nature friendly farming areas. And that could incorporate protected sites as well. And very importantly, just to flag that it doesn't just apply to the terrestrial environment. You know, this rewilding can apply to the marine environment. Um, so this is how this is how we see the 30% the by 2030 being delivered. These, these land management schemes will be absolutely fundamental uh, to that, pivotal to, to the success of that, uh, if we are to achieve this 30% by 2030. Now, another uh, policy opportunity is through approaches to tree planting. And you, you, know, you do have a, um, you know, a, a, the, uh, the glass tier scheme in, in Wales, and we have an England tree strategy, which has recently been consulted on. And Rewilding Britain has been a pains to, to, to point out that natural regeneration should be the default option. I, I love this photo of Horswater, which shows natural regeneration on one side of the, the lake and uh, intensive uh, sheep grazing and conifer forestry on the other side and you can see the contrast between the two but there are plenty of places where natural regeneration will happen uh, but uh, but we fully accept that in some places tree planting will be necessary so not we're not discarding it um, as I mentioned earlier all rewilding projects should include natural regen if they're not allowing that then they're not rewilding but uh, just doing the analysis of the 23 projects in England uh, uh, 10 of them involve tree planting as well. But the, the, I'll just show you, I'll run this animation a couple of times, um, but this is how NEP changed through natural regeneration in the space of 15 years. And it shows you this amazing development of vegetation scrub uh, over that period. Now I'm gonna run it again. Um, and you will see uh, that you're starting with an arable field here and good hedgerows with, with um, lots of oak trees with acorns and bramble and blackthorn and buckthorn and hawthorn, dog rose, etc. So quite a lot of uh, uh, berries uh, and acorns, etc. that uh, can be distributed naturally into these fields either, either by, by mammals or, or insects. Anyway, I will run this again, this animation, and you will see this transition over a 15 year period. Uh, so initially animals are excluded and then grazing animals are allowed in. Land drains are blocked, so water sits in the land and you see this incredible transition. Um, now, another area that is, is, is worth, worth pushing for, for, for organizations like the Wildlife Trust is a, is a greater emphasis on natural flood management. I, as I say, I've been heavily involved in, uh, in England, and, but in the, I was national head of conservation for England and Wales for over 10 years. And I was very conscious that although we talked about natural flood management to, um, in, in that time, very little was actually done. And, and that's still the case in England, even though there's a policy which my team helped to establish. Um, so that is an area where we need to be we need to be doing much. Um, so um, so it is it's not it's not just inland where there are opportunities. And I've shown you the Stroud Suds example, which some of you may have heard of, where local authority put lots of uh, woody debris dams basically into small streams to help slow the flow on steep hills. But also, you know, there are opportunities around the coast for managed realignment, and I'm sure we we will sooner or later see more managed realignment schemes in Wales in due course. So, so natural flood management is an area which I'd love to see NRW engaging in more. And then there are a whole suite of other uh, policy opportunities that, that could crop up, including, uh, for example, net gain through planning. I know there is fraught with difficulties, but there's no reason why biodiversity net gain through planning couldn't uh, and shouldn't incentivize 
uh, rewilding in peri-urban areas close to where people are. Um, there are obviously carbon trading markets starting to develop. We are now looking in England at establishing national nature reserves for rewilding or actually redesignating existing national nature reserves for that. Um, there are organisations like the Army who own huge tracts of land who've got to get to net zero. And one of the ways they can do that is by uh, enabling the way they look after, or the way they manage or don't manage their land to, to sequester more carbon. And there are things like nature recovery action plans, etc. So, so plenty of opportunities uh, being developed at the moment, not least because we're, we, we, we're, we've left Europe and we've got our own, we've got our own policies and, and procedures to develop. And then there are more specific things that ex exciting areas like the promotion of the use of rare breeds, which is often the case in rewilding projects. They're often used uh, rare breeds that are appropriate for that part of the country. And a very, a very excitingly virtual fencing where you have a GPS collar on, a, on an animal or sit on several of the animals and the flock can be programmed um, to just stay in certain areas with these, with these uh, GPS collars, which avoids the need for fencing. Various funding parts and, uh, and then, of course, opportunities for species reintroductions. Uh, and as you, you can see the stats here, uh, 16 of the 23 projects that I assessed have had species reintroductions on them. Not all of them are the charismatic megafauna that you might think. Some of them are involve alpine plants, for example, or, or uh, juniper, or maybe certain species of butterfly, etc. But these are uh, these are the most popular examples: beaver, white stork, and water vole. And you know, I these these are the sorts of species where you know we will see more more reintroductions taking place around the country. Pine martin, as you know. It, appears according to, to, to evidence from Scotland and Ireland, pine martin appears to reduce gray squirrel numbers and, and thus uh, enable an increase in recovery of red squirrel, which is fantastic. So you've almost got two for the price of one there. And we will, I hope, eventually see beavers back in the wild, truly in the wild. There are already several uh, wild populations uh, south of the border, um, but it would you know, I'm hoping that in England we will, in the next few years, see that happening, and I hope uh, I hope we go the same way in Wales, because uh, there's no doubt that that species in particular is uh, is a fantastic deliverer of biodiversity recovery as well as incredible benefits in terms of water quality, flood risk, uh, etc. Um, and the studies in the southwest of England have shown this. And look at those look at those bottles of water. The one on the left is the, the water, the dark bottle is the water entering the site where the beavers were in an enclosure uh, in, in North Devon, and the clear bottle is the water coming out of the site. Uh, just a few, just a small area uh, occupied by beavers in a, in a small catchment, but that's the difference they make to the amount of suspended material in, in the water in the stream system there. So we have for this sort of thing, we have great evidence and we, we just need government to uh, to steal itself, make a brave decision and let's get these animals back into the right places with the right management strategy in place. And we've developed, I've been part of the River Otter Beaver Trial Steering Group, and we've developed a, a strategy which would deal with them where they cause problems, a mechanism for doing that. And we've, we're waiting for government response on that. So that's where we're at, but let's be honest, we've got a biodiversity crisis, we've got a climate emergency. We, we really do need to act now. We, you know, we haven't got time to wait. We need to crack on with this. Um, but in, in order for us to do that, we really do have to rewild our mindset. And this cartoon I love because that kind of sums up where we're at <laughs> you know, for, for, with some of this decision-making. We, we, you know, we, we need to accept that you know, we don't need to control everything quite as much. You know, if we can just rewild our thinking, then we can make this great step forward. So thank you for listening, folks. Um, I will stop sharing now and uh, I will happily take questions. Thank you.
Th thank you very much, Alistair. Of a fantastic, uh, fantastic talk. Um, um, which, yeah, which, yeah, and, and pe if people want to get themselves ready for asking questions, I'm sure uh, there may be quite a few. If you want to put the videos on, by all means, do. Um, um, I'm watching Jill's screen for anybody who might want to ask a question and put their hand up. I'm also going to be looking in the participants uh, and, and if you if there any virtual hands that might be going up. Um, I can see some people have actually unmuted themselves already. Does anybody want to ask a question? If they can just alert us to that. Um, there's some... Anybody? I can't... Can you got a question? Oh, yeah, yeah, Tim. Yeah, yeah. Go on, Tim. Hello, uh, Alistair. Thank you very much for that fascinating talk. Um, it, it's very reassuring that you seem to be able to deliver a message which is uh, comprehended by central government. But there, there were three things that which occurred to me about the Wales, the Wales network. And one was that in North Wales, we have the Snowdonia National Park, which is a vast area. And I wondered if that might have some contribution to play in, in, the, in the rewilding uh, element. And there are also the, the National Trust have a, have a huge tract of land in Wales, and perhaps they might, they, well, they're already doing work in, in this capacity. And I wondered if this might, might tie in to the overall strategy that you're working towards. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure it does, and I'm sure it will. Um, so I'm dealing with the National Trust regularly at sort of director level, and I have recently had good conversations with their Welsh team. And in fact, I'm due to present and have a meeting with the Welsh team uh, very soon, which is great. That's, a, that's an important step forward. Um, the, the, in terms of the national parks, um, I'm pretty certain there are there will already be places that would comfortably qualify as rewilding sites according to the according to the definition and principles that we use, and they would match up with some of the case studies that are already on our network pages. I, I'm pretty sure they're out there, but um, you know, for obvious reasons, we've treaded sensitively, and I'm I'm really waiting for people to to contact me about places that I can then visit with them uh, to, to check that they are what we'd call rewilding and then to determine whether they are, would like them promoted in that way. Now, I, you know, I realise in some cases that people won't want, to, won't want their sites to be uh, on the rewilding network for various reasons at the moment. But it, it would be just good to know that there are these places because I, ha I have a I have a confidential list as well as a public list. So those examples that I showed you in that in the presentation, they're, they're examples who are happy to be on the website, happy for me to talk about them publicly. But there's a whole bunch of others who are below the radar, if you like, who who are definitely on the rewilding spectrum, but not necessarily ready to be called rewilding. So thanks, Alex. So just one supplementary question briefly. There, there, there is a sort of um, unease in some areas that rewilding is, uh, is a sort of a, an eco-bonkers destructive element which is not really uh, helping food production in the country and it's incompatible with food production. But have you encountered that and how do you deal with it? Well um, I deal with it by disproving it uh, with, the, with the evidence that I've got from, from those projects. So every single one of the rewilding projects uh, that, uh, that I've seen, and I think I've seen all the, all the biggest and best in England, every single one of them still produces food. And every single one of them is working on marginal land, where actually reducing stock numbers makes economic sense anyway. You'll probably be aware of various studies and done by Chris Clark and others uh, in Yorkshire, which which demonstrate this, that you know we've tended to pour more and more onto the land, and we and we haven't made any extra profit in doing so. So so um so I I really you know I I just try and demonstrate that these projects are actually still producing food, and of course they're producing so much more besides in terms of other public uh, in terms of public goods. Um, and you know it's actually really refreshing to hear Phil Stocker. Chief Exec of the Sheep Association say, actually, that's nothing. 3% is nothing. No, I wouldn't worry about it. You know, he's not worried about it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, jo, 
Do you want to, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for a very interesting talk. I wanted to ask about the um, tree planting. I assume it's just in terms of the areas of for rewilding that you're um, saying that you don't want people, you would much prefer people to, um, to have natural regeneration than tree planting because I can't see um, most places being suitable for just waiting for natural regeneration i would think in apart from in the rewilding areas you would probably have to rely more in order to get broadleaf and you know mixed blends um, don't get um, don't get me wrong joe i i um i i meant there should be a hierarchical decision making process so you would assess a site to see whether natural regeneration is likely in the time frame that you need it to happen uh, and and that should be your first decision. And, and and if not, then you look at assisted regeneration, which might mean maybe harrowing the land to allow trees to seed into it because the sward is so dense and of no biodiversity value. That might be your second option. And then the third option is planting. But as I say, 50% of the rewilding sites have got tree planting going on in them. I'm involved in a very big one in, in Yorkshire, where we planted 230,000 trees this winter. Um, that's because the, tree, the, the variety of trees is really poor in the area. The, the, the landscape is, has been intensively sheep grazed for a long time. Uh, and there, the, the sparsity of trees, I think it's 6% tree cover in that particular landscape. So planting was the, one of the big options, but we are also allowing natural regen there. But it, it, you know, that's a case in point. There'll be plenty like it. So it's not so much that it's a rewilding site where, where one would make that decision. It's, it's just depending on the characteristics of the site. Is it likely to regenerate naturally? We haven't got time to wait for decades because of, or for all these reasons I've discussed. Mm. So if you need to get on and plant trees, then so be it. Right, because I know in Wales, the Welsh government is promoting tree planting quite heavily isn't it yeah yeah but what i would like them to do is promote the two with this sort of <laughs> yeah. hierarchical process and i and I, I think i've just managed to convince forestry commission that they we, we have a nature for climate fund in in, in england which pays which funds tree planting right. and uh, i think I've, i'm pretty sure i've convinced them now that they should have natural regen sitting alongside tree planting as one of the things they'll incentivize with the next round of that funding. So yeah, I'd like to see Welsh government taking the same sort of approach, the dual, you know, dual approach with a hierarchical decision-making process. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I've got a question from the chat uh, now uh, from Cathy, Cathy Coombs. Uh, she says, a very convincing talk, thank you. And what was the time frame for the two landscape animations? How yeah. long that process take, she's asking? Yeah, very good question. Um, sorry, I should have said that. Um, in the lowland situation, that's probably a 10 year time frame. And in upland, it's more like 15 years plus. It is something, well, we're actually doing, I went into a studio to do a proper narration for that video last week. And um, well, that's one of the things we thought, oh, we need to make sure we, we clarify that. <laughs> that's good. That's, that's, yeah, that's good. That's good. Is that okay with that, Cathy? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, uh, Jay Chantry, uh, we need big organisations like the National Trust and RSPB to set the plunge and do this. Any progress there? Um, speaking for England, speaking for England, and I don't, you know, they're national organisations, so I'd like to think they will, you know, be roughly consistent. Um, the National Trust, National Trust is still quite sensitive because they've got you know, some quite difficult issues around tenancies on their land, um, but they have got some great examples. Wild Ennerdale, of course, National Trust are a partnership, a partner in, and there are um, one or two other sites which have uh, a approached us and I've been to advise them and they are now rewilding. Um, so, so yes, they are doing good things. The RSPB, well, there's Horswater and Geltsdale and uh, Wallasey Island, which are all RSPB sites that are on our rewilding yeah. network. So I can point to individual examples, but then neither organization is yet at the point where it's really embraced it across the piece as, as an option. 
Um, so still work to do, I'm afraid. And, I, and I, as I said earlier, I accept that in Wales, it is, it is more difficult. Yeah. Maybe I could ask, well, what about the Wildlife Trust, uh, the Living Landscapes uh, Nature Recovery Network? Is that, is that, could that tie in somehow? Uh, yes, absolutely. And, and again, very strong support. I was with Craig Bennett last Friday, who's the Chief Exec of the Wildlife Trust yeah. nationally, yeah. And, um, and Rob Stoneman, who he's recently appointed to lead on this kind of work. So, so nationally, great. Individual trusts around the country, great. Just speaking to Kent Wildlife Trust today about Wilder Bleen. But, but again, then again, there are some others who are much more reticent. So again, work in progress. Yeah, fair enough. That's good. That's good. Uh, Cathy's got a, a, a very different question. Cathy Coombs again. I was wondering what, what your position was on domestic cats. I can't imagine a species like wild cats recovering while domestic cats are allowed to roam the countryside. It's going to be. Yeah. yeah so so um, I'm told by the Bavarian, a Bavarian expert who came over and also by Derek Gow, who is is one of the guys involved in the wild cat reintroduction proposals south of the border. Um, I'm told by those people, in particular the Bavarian guy, that actually it's a numbers game. The reason that wild cats are hybridizing with feral and mainly feral cats in Scotland is because their numbers have been so fragmented uh, and reduced that they are, you know, they have to they have to breed with feral cats. Whereas if you reintroduce in large numbers, uh, then they are more likely to kill feral cats and not breed with them. Now, I'm not an expert. I'm relying on evidence from people on the continent where wild cats are recovering, where they've done successful reintroduction programs. But it could very well be a numbers game. But any reintroduction project has to follow the IUCN uh, guidelines and principles. And, you know, I will, well, we're not going to be directly involved in reintroductions. But, you know, I, if I'm asked for my opinion, I will want to be, be assured that they are following the most expert advice on this. And is that okay with that, Cathy? If you want to come, come, on, come back, you can do, but okay. Um, so Tina's got a, a question. Uh, um, is there any site database list of land for sale, which could be ideal for rewilding? I <laughs> wish there was. <laughs> <laughs> I um, One of the joys uh, of, of, of this is that you do actually get people with with finance who want to acquire land for rewarding. The trouble is I don't have a database telling me telling me where all the where all the available bits are, where people where where there's land up for sale that would be suitable. However, where we've got individual sort of strategic projects, and I've got one in the Peak District called Wild Peak, which is run by the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. Um, which I helped to set up, we helped to set up. Um, they, they are doing opportunity mapping as we speak uh, to identify where there might be suitable sites and willing landowners. Um, so, so yes, and, and you'll also, this will also be the case in Scotland where they've got, uh, where there are these kind of strategic projects being established. But yeah, I'm afraid the answer is largely no in England and Wales. Thanks, thanks, Alistair. Uh, we've got Maureen, would you like to put your question to Alex? Yes, um, I want to um, ask about meat eating. A lot of um, conservation organisations and high profile conservationists talk about being vegetarian or vegan, but I can see that eating meat, well, that we need to educate people about eating high quality meat, but you know, it's as without which these rewilding um, projects can't work because you need the herbivores to have an economic value to actually make them viable. Um, um, but I haven't heard this discussed that much. I mean, it seems to be the net meat, of course, is very um, um, highly priced and, and not available to everyone. But in the end, it needs to be an education for everyone, maybe to eat less meat, but to insist on better quality, better reared meat. I'd be interested just to hear a little bit about that, please. Well, well, Maureen, I'm absolutely with you. That's exactly what we say that, you know, you, for the reasons I explained earlier, we, we, do, we, we can't graze with the formerly native herbivores, large herbivores that we once had, not, not yet anyway. Um, so that's going to be many years away before we, 
may in some places have bison back you know for example although you know i just went to see a site in kent where they they will be introducing them next year but that's just one site in a large enclosure um so we have to have these proxies uh most of the proxies produce good meat and and therefore why not harvest them you know if we're going to have these animals it, it would be shameful to just slaughter them and leave them lying around so you know they should be harvested using best practice uh and 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 so that's what we would encourage and as i said um all of the all of the sites i've looked at do that there's only one site where uh they don't have cattle or or yeah where they don't have cattle or pigs and that's an mod site behind a fence where they just have red deer but they still harvest a few of those to keep the numbers at a certain level because there's no predators for the red deer behind the fence and so uh yeah every site every rewilding site will 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 require that um and i i bear in mind the stats i talked about the, you know the five percent ambition and bear in mind that we're at a fraction of one percent at the moment uh rewilding in this country fraction of one percent of the country um you know i don't i don't think we will get to the, the stage this century where changes in meat eating behavior impact on the ability to use these herbivores on rewilding sites. Um, yes, I'm sure there will be changes in that behavior, but but um, but I, I you know I, I really cannot see it affecting these areas. Is that okay? Was that sort of roughly? But uh, abs no, abs absolutely. I mean, it's educating people that you know just becoming vegan is not necessarily the answer. It's insisting on whatever you eat, whether it's the vegetables, the grains, the meat, the dairy, that you find out how it's reared and it's been reared in a responsible yeah. and um, environmentally, um, you, you know, balanced way. And uh, yeah. but there are not enough people, I don't think, talk about well reared meat and it, it's probably out of the price range of quite a few people as it is well, the more, hopefully as it you know it becomes more available and that will change yeah ex exactly yeah okay. thanks Maury. thank you thank you uh, one from andy here um how can we address and hopefully overcome long-standing ill feeling or mistrust between landowners and environmentalists well i suspect there will always be some because there'll always be people at either end of the the spectrum polar you know seeking a polarized argument but the way you know i've been in this position twice in my career so i you know when i was appointed as the first conservationist in the water industry in the thames catchment i was dealing with thousands of engineers who were who had been straightening deepening and widening rivers and plastering them with concrete and dredging rural channels for farming and along comes this young whippersnapper who suggests politely that there might be a different way of doing this uh, that is less drastic. Now, we, we, we've been through a similar process in the last few years with rewilding. It is initially seen to be threatening, but actually when one starts to demonstrate through practice on the ground that it's not nearly the threat that people thought it was, and it's not nearly as dramatic as people thought it was, and actually people can create jobs out of this and livelihoods and deliver significant biodiversity gain. That's the way to do it. For me, I'm focusing entirely on trying to respond to uh, landowners who are willing to explore the idea rather than tackling those who are anti. That's, that's our focus. And it seems to be working because the more examples we've got, the easier it is to convince government that policies need to change to enable more more people to be doing these good things and that that's it you know i've used this network that we had in england i've used it directly to influence future policy on natural regeneration and future policy on rewilding in the environmental land management scheme and i hope the same can happen in wales but we will need to have some examples that we can showcase to welsh government to show them what an amazing difference it can make to biodiversity and and public goods uh, whilst remaining or, or being uh, economically viable. Mm. Good, good. Yeah, that's, that seems to be the way out there, I would have thought, yes. 
there. Uh, Fiona asks, 250 acres is the minimum you're, you're, you're looking for for joining uh, the pro Rewilding Britain project, but how can small landowners add to this initiative? Can they, can they join together maybe? Yeah, yeah um, well, first thing to say is anyone can join the Rewilding Network. Uh, you, you know, there are smaller scale landowners than that, and there are some organizations uh, or individuals who are not um, who are not landowners. But when it comes to having a case study on the website, at the moment, we're saying 250 acres to 1500 acres is what we call medium scale. Uh, and that and that's the de minimis. And then large scale is 1500 plus. But every but but to come back to the point, yes, you're absolutely right. Trying to find neighbours who might, you know, if you have say got 50 acres, have you got any neighbours who might be prepared to go down the same journey with you and, and gradually build build out from there. That's the way I'd uh, you know, I hope we will see it developing at a small scale. Fair enough. Okay, that's it. That's, that sounds, 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 sounds uh, good. So, so if, if, there were, if there were small, smaller scale pro, uh, 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 landowners who maybe another landowner wasn't necessarily adjacent to them, but those possibilities of connectivity that, that, that and, of, and like a kind of a, like satellite wildlife sites connecting yeah. up that, that might be my yeah it might, might, right. kind of, might qualify that's right and, and, yeah. and probably at that scale you're probably more likely to be nature friendly farming because you haven't got enough space for yeah. viable numbers of large herbivores roaming freely yes. um, but you are moving in that direction and the more you know gradually more people are likely to come on board especially when the future farming scheme kicks in or it becomes obvious that it's kicking in, you, it's likely that more people will be prepared to consider going down that route. Okay, okay, that sounds, sounds, sounds positive, that sounds, sounds very good. Um, I'm just looking through the, uh, uh, anybody got the hand up at all? No, 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 no yeah. virtual. I'm just looking through the, the questions here. Uh, uh, Stephen Phillips has just put his hand oh, up oh, there. Yeah. He's, Stephen, he's, do you want to get out? He's out on his patch there. He's, out, he's outside. I've been, watching <laughs> Steve, I've been watching Stephen there. Lucky <laughs> devil. Go on, Stephen, go for it. He's mute. Un un unmute, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Stephen. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with, with the situation in North Wales, with uh, often amongst the general public, there's a kind of misunderstanding about what the national park is, what Snowdonia National Park is, and and what the nature of land tenure there is. Um, so I'm thinking sites that are ostensibly owned by the National Trust, a huge area of the Carnethi, the majority of the Carnethi is owned by the National Trust, but of course they don't have the grazing rights. Those grazing rights are privately owned um, by other individuals. And how do you deal with those situations, which I think is probably the, the case for much of the uplands of North Wales and Mid Wales, that you know, land tenure is so complicated. The person who owns the land doesn't own all the rights, all the ways in which that land is used. Yeah, that's yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and it's a familiar situation in England as well. Actually, you know, there are ten there are tenants, farmers on a lot of the land uh, that I've been dealing with, where um, they they um, they have rights that last for generations, and they don't. You know, if they don't want to give them up, they don't have to. Um, so, so what you will find, what what we often find is that uh, a landowner, and it could be either a, an NGO or or a government agency or a private individual, they may end up rewilding some of the land. But because they're such large landowners, if you've got several thousand hectares of land, uh, you there will some often be an opportunity for rewilding, say, a thousand hectares of that where there are tenants who perhaps were planning to give up anyway or and the son or daughter doesn't want to take over or where their agreement is coming to an end and they're happy to negotiate a different arrangement so it, it should never be a case of forcing this on individual tenants it should always be done through discussion and agreement but what that does mean is that one won't necessarily be able to rewild entire areas in an ownership at the same time uh, uh, and so I'm dealing with quite a few landowners where they I mean the common a common scenario is biggest big estate owners who own say 3,000 acres will rewild a thousand of it a thousand acres worth of it 
because that's the poorer quality land usually coincides with where the tenants are less um, less desperate to continue farming it. Often these tenants have got land they graze elsewhere as well. Um, and so, so far we found a way, you know, in, a, in, in each site. But um, I, I fully accept that, you know, perhaps- I, I mean, uh, I, I, I was meaning more- Smaller scale in, in your situation. I was meaning not so much the case where it was um, tenants involved, but um, private landowners with, with farms on the edge of the uplands who own the grazing rights themselves. So the National Trust is not a property that they've tenanted out and a farmer then is able to graze and it might be a multi-generational tenancy. I'm talking about very specifically that, you know, the National Trust owns the Carnevi um, and then a whole series of commoners have common rights, which, uh, which they own yeah, that are sorry. associated with their privately owned holding that's outside the boundary of the National Trust owned land. Yeah, sorry. Is there any I'm potential for a common... scheme to kind of offer some sort of compensation in those cases? Or uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, I, yeah, I don't. I'm not aware of a solution to that yet. I mean, it is an issue we're we're looking at. We're actually looking at Dartmoor, for example, at the moment, trying to find a way in there. Um, yes, that is a common problem, a, ch a challenge, if you like. Um, and we haven't made much progress in those situations, apart from one or two examples where the the common the commoners rights have been bought out by agreement but, this, you know, uh, in in uh, in the northern half of the carnethai it's not particularly profitable it's come down to identity politics we're farmers this is what we do these are very smug conservationists this is what they want and even those farmers that i know who are very conservation minded themselves to feel an obligation to close ranks with their yeah. group uh, and you know and to almost be ashamed to speak of their interest in yeah. conservation within that group but because of the constant smug attacks you know from the all-knowing conservationists they feel the need to build this identity you know stick within that identity and it's how can we persuade conservationists to approach that differently and avoid yeah. the identity politics that prevents people being prepared to engage with this, given that what it's worth to them financially is actually relatively small. Yeah. Well, look, um, I, I fully acknowledge that it's a you know it is a really difficult scenario, and and uh, it is one you know I have come across several times. However, I prefer I'm preferring to focus on those people who are minded to want to talk uh, about change because I can't cope with them anyway the sheer numbers of those now anyway and so my 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 view is let, let's focus on the willing or, or or those that are at least happy to have a discussion and let's let's gradually influence uh change on the ground and indeed policy change by demonstrating that there are more and more people taking this on and it's not impacting on them detrimentally and they are still producing food and delivering what the government would like them to deliver and and i and that's uh, this comes back then to the to the sustainable land management proposals which you know may well swing more people at least swing more people from being anti to being on the fence and really willing to have a discussion okay, okay Stephen. thank you I'm, I'm aware i'm aware of the time you know, pressing now just uh, just there's very few more questions that's okay alice so there's one here yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, who dj d john i think the name is um supports very supportive of rewilding but considers to be the, uh, wales to have been dewilded by uh, by landowners over the last century um and wonders if um Dua Cymru, welsh water have shown any interest at all uh, in rewilding um yeah not i've not approached them um, since first meeting them four years ago when I started. So, so I am now I'm resurrecting uh, contacts in Wales. I, I, that is an organization I'll need to speak to. I mean, any major landowner, MOD, mm. RSPB, National Trust, uh, Crown Estate, etc. I will, I will be wanting to pick up comms with. Um, the, uh, be interested shouldn't they for the reasons that i'm sure you all know well that you know rewilding can deliver massive benefits in terms of water quality uh in in the in the right place reducing runoff uh and sediment loads yeah yeah 
so yeah. so yes um it is an area i need to pick up on but there's no there's no obvious connection that we've established yet not as yet but hopefully no. in the future yeah 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 uh, so a follow on from, from Joe's question from Emma, uh, what are the ecolo ecological benefits of natural regeneration over tree planting? Um, several things. First of all, um, when you're planting trees, you are bringing in trees from usually from another place, hopefully as local provenance as possible, but another place with a completely different set of microbial associations and mycory mycorrhizal associations. Um, so it's always better to have local seed that is that is naturally sown that will develop, generally speaking, where it wants to develop with the right mycorrhizal associations for its particular uh, genetic uh, makeup. And and so that is, you know, that is a fundamental principle. And interestingly, I do know one project where they one of the introductions they've done is of fungal mycorrhizae to go with the trees that they're planting. Of course, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's an important consideration, of course, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, quick question here from uh, about marine rewilding. Are there um, are there any examples of this in North Wales or Wales marine well, rewilding? Yeah. Um, I was. Um, I did go to a meeting early on in the Summit to Sea project, and the Marine Conservation Society were a uh, partner in that project, yeah. and they were proposed. I went to a meeting to help um, evaluate some of the um actions that they were proposing to implement and one and some of them did relate to the marine environment from mcs and they and as i recall they included things like possibility of restoring oyster beds and oyster communities the first thing i should say is that any any marine rewilding project should automatically become a no take a no take zone yeah. because because the impact of fishing and fishing techniques is usually pretty significant in the marine environment. So there's a big project off the Sussex coast, which has just been uh, just been launched recently, which will do just that across a belt of the marine offshore environment. So certainly no take fisheries. Then consideration of establishing um, benthic habitats, which which support uh, certain species like oysters. Possibly the reintroduction of other types of, uh, uh, you know, fish species, for example, possibly, but I think it's mainly about stopping doing damaging things to start with, uh, and ensuring that you have the right substrate to enable these reef type species to recover. Yeah, yeah, that was a question from Will Harris, but Cathy Coombs says that, uh, that it'd be really interesting to see uh, an animation of a rewilded sea habitat. <laughs> yeah, you got me. I saw that pop up, and I thought oh, no, I'm going to flag that to my comms people. That's then that, that, that'll be your next talk, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Could, you might need to give me a while for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, that, 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 I've done a good bit too. Uh, urban, urban, urban rewilding. Uh, um, Jake's asking about possibility of uh, does this is it just rural areas, or could this happen in cities? Uh, some kind of rewilding of sorts. Yeah. There's no reason why one couldn't have um, connecting corridors into cities and, and the river corridor is an obvious situation. A lot of our towns and cities are built on rivers. Um, so one has an opportunity at least for a connecting corridor, but really to be, don't forget what I said about scale, you know, looking for a 250 acre green space in a, in a town or a city is quite difficult. I do know I'm dealing actually with a London borough who've got 2,000 acres within the M25, which is currently uh, farmland, which which we are looking at possibly rewilding. But that opportunity is pretty rare. So I think it's more a case of finding ways of increasing wildness along river corridors, taking, providing connectivity not only for wildlife out into wilder areas in the peri-urban environment, but also for people to you know to access those wilder areas just on the on the on the fringes of towns. Uh, that's, that's great, great. Uh, Tina's asking about the biggest obstacle rewilding the London Weapons Centre. Maybe that's a, a, a big question, maybe. <laughs> um, well, I, uh, the rewilding the London Wetlands Centre. Well, you've not, you've not rewilded it though, I suppose, have you? Uh, no, no, no. That was, I mean, that was when I was way back in the Environment sure, Agency oh, and it was oh, yeah, basically yeah. turning what was a series of concrete reservoirs into a natural 
semi-natural wetland, but yeah. you're still relying on pumping water in from the freshwater Thames yeah. to feed the site. And you, you have to manage water levels and manage rebed. That's quite a, that's a nature conservation, you know, a traditional nature conservation site, that one. Yeah, not, 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 not potential for rewilding, I guess not really. Uh... Not, not because of all those constraints, you know, um, it, it, the, the, the priority there, and this is actually quite an important discussion topic, the priority there is to take 40 hectares of green space that's left in that bit of London yeah. and make the best of it by creating a mosaic of individual habitats. So yeah. reed beds, grazing marsh, deep yeah. water, swamp, etc. We, we, we designed that. So you've got all these juxtaposed wetland habitats that people can see what lives here, what lives in that habitat, what lives there. And, and that's a very managed situation. And I think in terms of education and visitor experience, it provides more for, for people than if you were to rewild it. Because it's only because it's only 40 hectares. Yeah, of course, yeah, that's fair, fair enough. That's a fair comment. Yeah. Fair. Well, I, I, I can't. I don't, I don't I'm going to ask Jill if anybody else looking like they want to ask a question, I think. No, not a question. No, no not, lots, lots of lots of very lots positive, of positive comments. Lots of very positive comments. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, and, and Jake replied to your uh, urban kind of rewilding. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Great talk. And then uh, Mark Goddard is saying he's carrying on with his own small scale rewilding. It's five on his five acres. <laughs> which good is night. Great. Good great. Yeah. Could yeah. I just could I just reiterate my ask if anyone does know of any sites that yes. they think might yeah. be suitable anywhere in Wales, yeah. please do connect me up. Uh, I'd love to follow up. That's fair, fair enough. Yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate that. And I'll. What's, what's that? There's another. There's another question come through. Sally Clifton. Oh, very inspiring talk. Many thanks. You mentioned a forty percent increase in employment. Where would the money? To, yeah. Where would the money to pay them come from? I guess increased business, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, it's a it's a range of things. I part of the analysis I did I I did log all the types of income that they get. But um, just to give you rattle off a few examples. Um, so nature nature tourism, camping, glamping, safaris. That's quite a common one. Um, uh, there is uh, obviously some still some produce coming from the land. Um, then there will be obviously in most cases they will be signed up to stewardship of some sort because they're doing good things that qualify for stewardship. So they get some kind of government uh, subsidy, but then most farmers get that anyway through basic payment schemes. And then um, some of them run events, so they might link it with a wedding wedding event or educational activities uh, or, or, or other products from the land, maybe timber or unusual foodstuffs such as honey. I mean, I know one site where they've got hundreds of beehives on a rewilding site, several hundred, I think 600 or something. Um, another site I mentioned produces top quality spirits from the natural uh, botanicals that are growing in the rewilding area. So there's a whole suite of uh, uh, opportunities and usually if not always they are not reliant on they haven't got all their eggs in one basket they've got several different funding mechanisms so if one thing's struggling there's usually something else that helps offset that excellent thank you thank you we've got we've actually got a hand up um anna would you like to kind of just um just got time hopefully anna, let's anna, just ask a question can't you're you going to unmute oh yeah Hello, can you see and hear me okay? Hello. Yeah. Um, just quickly, um, I work in the field of um, biodiversity and stuff with the police and the fire in North Wales, and I also sit on the public service boards with the councils and the NRW. The question I was going to ask, do you think there's going to be a bit of a situation coming in the future where available land for rewilding is going to be lost to uh, renewable technologies and the surge for the councils for creating their own electricity as part of the decarbonisation which is uh, going on with the view to the Welsh Government wanting the public sector to be net zero carbon by 2030? Yeah, good question because um, I suspect there will be places where I can imagine solar panels being plastered across across the countryside which might otherwise lend itself to to rewilding now we haven't we haven't come across that conflict yet in any of the sites i've been dealing with but i can see i could i can see this happening 
uh, in future, yes. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily mean that certain numbers of solar panels uh, in the landscape is necessarily incompatible with rewilding. If you've just got a small area of solar panels in a big area of rewilding, but um, but I, you know, the two where, where the solar panels are, you're not going to be allowed. You're not going to be able to allow natural processes to to truly recover because you're not going to be able to have big grazing animals roaming around it. I know they have sheep under solar panels, but that that tends to keep the sward very short. So so I think it is largely incompatible. Um, and I think in future there probably will be some. You're right. There probably will be some conflict, um, but I haven't seen it yet. Okay, thank you very much. So what I'm saying is, I, it's not it's not a constraint in terms of progress at the moment. Sooner yeah. or later, there probably it will might be. be. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Anna, for, for raising that. Okay. Uh, well, I think uh, that's probably all the questions uh, finished now. I think, uh, and uh, so it, it, everyone saying it's very interesting. It, it really it, it just believes it easy now for us to, to thank you uh, Alistair for kind of uh, for such an extraordinarily interesting talk for, for answering so, the questions so many merry and varied and quite detailed thank you very much for that and, and so to look forward to a so a, a project in Wales really um yeah, yeah fingers crossed <laughs> fingers crossed for, yes. for, for, for <laughs> numerous people uh, maybe from tonight and from your other contacts that you're going to make in Wales in the future to actually people will come forward. Uh, and we'll see you on, we'll be thinking about it ourselves too, of course. Uh, we'll be uh, talking we'll, about uh, this. And we'll, 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 <laughs> yeah. hopefully, we'll hopefully be in touch. Um, yes. And maybe one day ask you to give a, a more detailed talk about rewilding. That would be interesting in itself, really. If, if there's, Yeah, I'd love, well, if love to people, come and see you guys. And hopefully by then I'll have some actual examples from Wales to share with you. That'd be superb. That would be superb. That would be superb. Great, so thank, thank you. you but so I think much. we've kept you long enough. Thanks for giving us your time. We really it's appreciate it. Uh, it, just, it just leaves it for us to, if, you, if people that we've got still got, how many people, 37 people still here listening. Um, <laughs> um, if they want to kind of uh, unmute themselves, uh, unmute themselves and and, um, and and show their appreciation of, of this <laughs> evening's talk by giving a bit of a talk and a thank you. And that's that's thank you. That's fantastic. That's really good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Take care. Keep staying safe. <laughs> that's the important thing. Bye bye. 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 No <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Pleasure. Cheers, Stephen. Cheers, Stephen. Bye, then. There you are. <laughs> Good to see you.